one of these kind of categories one by one and give you a sense of what you can do, show you a bunch of demos. I think we have like 12 demos by the time all is said Lots and done. Um, and then uh, uh, kind of one by one point you in the direction of other talks and resources that you can use to dive in deep throughout the rest of the week and then uh, once you get home. So Office 365 platform, what is it? it? It starts with the Microsoft Graph. And hopefully by now everybody here is already familiar with the Microsoft Graph, you've heard of it. Uh, the key thing that I want you to think of for the purpose of this talk is that it is the API to access data and intelligence in the Microsoft Cloud. Uh, whether you're accessing people's calendar, whether you're accessing uh, the documents that they have, their organizational hierarchy, or insights that we've generated about that. Who works with one another? What are interesting documents? Who's an expert in your organization with SharePoint? You can get that from the Microsoft Graph. And on top of the Microsoft Graph, we have both built our own applications. You can see these canvases here that I'll get to in just a second. Uh, things like Word and Teams and SharePoint and Outlook. Uh, but you'll also be able to build your own applications, whether those are Windows applications, iOS applications, uh, Android applications, web applications. They can connect it directly into the Microsoft Graph as well and take advantage of those same insights. Within your own applications, we increasingly have experiences that you can embed. So you can take things like our authoring canvases, like uh, the Word online experience, and you can embed it inside of your own web application if you're storing Word documents. Uh, and also individual controls. So if you want a control to be able to sign somebody in or to list a set of files inside of OneDrive, uh, we have controls that you can now embed inside of your application and do that really quickly and fluently. Within our applications, across the canvases, we have this notion of extensions. And this is when you want to teach our canvas to do something new. Uh, a new domain, a new behavior that we've never taught it, an integration with your line of business system that lets it connect directly to the place where you've got canonical data about your business. And those come in kind of two flavors. One is these kind of generic extensions, things like actions or task panes or dialog boxes that kind of function the same way across all of these canvases. And then in other cases, there are extensions that are specific to a type of canvas. So when you think about something like a bot or a connector, we want that to work the same way, uh, that, same way in Teams as it does in Outlook, and even more so the same way it does in Outlook for Windows as it does in Outlook Online and Outlook iOS. And so we really think about these canvases as being the unit that you're extending. You want to go and target a, a conversation, and you want to extend that with a new bot or a new connector to integrate your new functionality. Uh, and then the last piece of the puzzle here is a, a notion called custom content. And that's within these canvases, when you want to integrate a type of content that we don't necessarily understand. So something like uh, inside of Teams, if you wanted to have a poll, uh, you could do that through something called uh, actionable messages and simple declarative markup. If you wanted to create a custom visualization inside of a Word document or inside of Excel, uh, you can use uh, specific HTML and JavaScript code in order to manage every last control on the page and create very customized experiences within that. Uh, so these are kind of the three pieces. pieces. You have the graph and the data that underlies both our applications and yours. Uh, you have the ability to extend our canvases with new behaviors, and the, you have the ability to uh, embed custom content inside and throughout Office canvases. That make sense? Awesome. So one thing we want to do is, is kind of give people a sense when we talk to customers how they can take advantage of it. The first thing people often jump to is, okay, now I'm going to write code. Awesome. So let's dive in and show a bunch of lines of code, and we will do plenty of that uh, in a little bit. But as a customer, there are ways before that that you can actually take advantage of the Office platform. And the first and sort of uh, lowest friction one is that we actually have thousands of applications that are packaged apps that you can go and get from a website. If they meet your needs, you can acquire them, you can try them out, you can deploy them throughout your organization as an administrator or, or to the right people within your organization. So the lowest friction way is actually to go find an existing package solution and get it. We also have a set of tools called Power Apps and Flow that let anyone within your organization, especially kind of that power user, go and create their own applications or their own workflows based on the building blocks that we have inside of Power Apps and Flow and the services that are in Microsoft 365. The next step is we've taken a bunch of our own custom code and the patterns around that custom code and created what we call reference solutions that show people how to take the building blocks that we have and use custom code in order to stitch them together for an experience that's really tailored to uh, something we don't have in the product but is an end-to-end -end solution, something like healthcare team huddles, and I'll show you that in just a minute. So we're really adapting, in this case, Microsoft 365 or Office 365 uh, to a specific industry. 
Uh, and then the last is custom development. So if I want to write some custom code from scratch, of course I can do that. And that's what many of you are probably first and foremost interested in. So those are kind of the spectrum of things that you have all the way from just going and getting something off the shelf uh, to writing something from complete scratch. So let's start real quick with a package application. Uh, there are thousands of package applications, like I said. You can go to AppSource, uh, appsource.microsoft.com, and see many of those applications that are distributed through our own channels. Um, you can see a few of them up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you really quickly a demo of SurveyMonkey, who's built a deep integration with Office 365. Uh, just to give you a sense of all those kind of abstract concepts that I just talked about, what that actually looks like in practice. All right, so I'm going to switch over, wake this machine up. And I'm actually going to start from uh, the SurveyMonkey website. Uh, so remember I told you you can go and create standalone web applications. This is one of those. This is SurveyMonkey.com. If you go there today, you'll see the same thing. And one of the first things you'll notice there uh, is that Office 365 is actually an option for logging in. They're, they are supporting single sign-on with Office 365. Uh, and once I choose an identity here, and I've already given it access to my data, but the first time I will be prompted to give it access to it, once I've connected it to the graph, it's able to grab things like my profile, so it has my username, it has things like my picture automatically pulled from the graph. Uh, and then when I actually go and work with a survey, so if I wanted to jump in here uh, and start modifying this Build 2018 Office Overview Survey, um, you'll see things that light up because it is connected to the graph. So if I want to go and uh, create some comments on this survey preview, and I wanted to, for example, uh, invite a few people, I can click Invite, and when I do that, because it's connected to the Office, to the Microsoft Graph, uh, it's actually querying all the people that I work with the most often, uh, and the ones that I work with in particular on a topic related to the word survey. And it's suggesting those as the first ones that I might want to go reach out to uh, and send this information to. So if I've sent people an email about surveys or co-authored documents that have anything to do with surveys, they're showing up at the top of this list. And even better, when I start to type, it's actually using the Microsoft Graph so that when I say Tristan, rather than the, I don't know, what are there, 10 other Tristans at Microsoft? Rather than the 10 other Tristans at Microsoft, it actually knows that I mean this Tristan. Uh, and he's the top of the suggestions there. When I type way, she's the top of the suggestions there. Uh, and then when I send that on, they get the same invite. They can sign in with their same identity and connect that way. Uh, you can also see that it integrates directly with OneDrive. Uh, so when I have this survey, say I wanted to take it out of SurveyMonkey and I actually wanted it to save it in my own system, I can actually choose that I want to save it to Microsoft OneDrive. This is going to use the Microsoft Graph in order to browse my OneDrive, let me pick a specific folder that I want to save it into, and then I can actually save that survey into OneDrive, and then when I browse OneDrive, I'll see those folders and I can click into it to, to continue editing my survey. So that's the notion of we've got the standalone web application connected to the graph. Let's real quick hop over and show a couple of experiences inside of Office. So now I'm inside of Teams. Uh, I'm inside of a specific channel here, and I want to ask people some questions. Uh, SurveyMonkey has extended this conversation canvas with a bot. And in particular, this bot uh, supports a couple of things. I can do help, but I can ask it a question, and it will go create a new poll for me. So I can say, what was the best demo from the keynote this morning? Uh, I really like the VS Live Share. Uh, there was a really cool Word demo, uh, some cool mixed reality. Uh, and when I put that in, SurveyMonkey will actually respond back with a card. And it'll say, here's the survey that I'm about to send. It's actually, because it's gray, I can see that it's kind of a private message just to me to make sure that this looks good. Uh, and then I can say, I'm ready, open this poll. It'll actually update this card in line. Uh, and then it will send this out to the entire group so that they can start voting on it and in line I can see results. So now SurveyMonkey is integrated through a bot. I can also go and create page canvases. Uh, so Survey has, SurveyMonkey has created a custom tab. So then I can go and look at the surveys that I've created inside SurveyMonkey. Uh, I can connect it to my SurveyMonkey instance uh, and I do connect with SurveyMonkey. Should be oh, not automatically signed in. Let's hope I don't have to do two-factor authentication. Fingers crossed. Uh, and then I can pick the survey, hit next, uh, and hit save. And now I've got the survey that I was just working on inside of SurveyMonkey actually integrated as a tab inside of Teams so that other people can preview it. I can have a conversation. I can ask Tristan about it. They can see the results as they come in. 
So you can see I was able to both connect to the Microsoft Graph from SurveyMonkey.com, uh, but I'm also able to connect into SurveyMonkey from experiences like Teams, so I get the mix of both those pieces of functionality. So that's kind of what I mean by a packaged application. All right, I will switch over. Get that right. Eight, five. Let's keep guessing. All right. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to hand it over to Tristan, sure. and he's going to talk about the next step in that continuum: Power Apps and Flow. Yeah, so as Rob said, we have a ton of really powerful APIs, extension points for you to go write custom code against. Um, but we also want to enable all of the power users in the organization, everyone who wouldn't label themselves a developer, to take advantage of all that data and intelligence inside the Microsoft Cloud and all those great extension points inside of our applications. So we partner really closely with the Power Apps and Flow team. Uh, are folks familiar with Power Apps and Flow? Have they played with them before? About half of you? Great. So Power Apps and Flow are these really great low-code, no-code tools. Uh, Power Apps lets you go design custom applications that can run in mobile or in the browser. Uh, I can go design simple quick forms, pull data from my backends, that sort of thing. Uh, Flow will let me take that data and orchestrate it across multiple services. So there are connectors built for many, many, many popular cloud services, or you can go author your own to pull data in, orchestrate it. You'll see an example of that in a second. And then the common data service for apps lets you say, hey, uh, I need some schematized data. Uh, we have a data store that has a bunch of really common entities defined in a common way. So you can tell your users, hey, all of our concept of customer, that's defined in CDS. So you can go build Power Apps on top of that definition of customer, knowing that it is a lingua franca across a bunch of different systems. Same thing with an order, same thing with an address, a ton of common entities you might want to use inside your organization. So Power Apps and Flow, really cool. Uh, there's one new piece of the Power Apps and Flow family that I wanted to show you for a second, and that is Flow integration into Excel. We will jump over to eight. eight. So here I am in an Excel online. Uh, a really common scenario we hear from customers is this idea of, I have data inside of Excel that I need to action on. Like it's a mail merge of every row needs to go out as a separate email, or hey, I need to take each one of these and send it out to a group of folks in Teams for comment. So we said, wow, that's a really powerful scenario that should work great in Flow. So what we did is partnered with the Flow team to build a Flow add-in right here for Excel. And I'd already installed it. You'd find it up here on the Data tab. Um, I could go click it, but I had already run it. The first thing you'll notice, for those of you who are familiar with our platform, is we're building this flow add-in on top of the same platform that you build your third-party integrations on. So it uses the same JavaScript APIs, the same add-in framework that you use yourselves, because we look at this as an incredibly powerful way to extend our own applications as we integrate across Office 365 and beyond. So these guys have built a really great JavaScript task pane. It takes advantage of a bunch of parts of Excel. You'll notice that even here it is smart enough to trap our events to know the flow wants to run on rows in this table. The button lights up when I'm in the table. It disables when I'm out of the table. So it's really smart about knowing that it's in the Excel context. But it has all the power of flow right there. So I can go and say, hey, I want to edit this flow. We'll take a look at it really quick. What I've done here is said, hey, I want to be able to select a row in Excel and do two things with that data of the many things I can do in flow. I want to go create an item in SharePoint. We can dig into that task. You can see. Through Flow's declarative UI, in this case, I'm not a developer. I don't want to think about code for writing to the SharePoint APIs. I was just able to go through a UI, pick the SharePoint site, pick the list, and say, hey, each of these fields inside of Excel should be promoted as a new item inside of that list. And then below, post the same message to Teams. So what I did was said, here's the team and the channel I care about, and I want to post this message. And that message is a combination of static text and, again, data from Excel that I want to push into that other part of the ecosystem. So if I close out of this, I won't actually change it right now. You'll see I can, for example, take this bottom row, say the target energy for this week should be 2018, because it's build 2018. As soon as I click in this row, it's a pretty aggressive bump in target energy. But so let's let the team know, because man, that generator is going to be working overtime. I can click here. And now, because I've defined this flow for myself, what used to be a task that took me going and copying and pasting a bunch of data out of Excel into SharePoint, and then going and hand authoring a new message in Teams becomes just a couple clicks. So I'll hit continue, and then I'll hit run. And that flow is now off to the races, taking that data. And if we jump over here, we'll see that new row has showed up immediately inside of SharePoint. And if I jump over to the Teams channel, there's that message coming in telling me that for this week, our target is 2018 megawatt hours. 
It's a really cool example of another addition to the Power Apps and Flow family that lets you connect without always being a developer, build these powerful integrations across our services, yours, and all the third-party things you might want to work off in the ecosystem. Really neat stuff. I'm really bad with numbers. So this week, uh, lots of cool stuff going on with Power Apps and Flow. We've got a couple announcements to show you as soon as we find the right machine. Uh, you saw the Flow integration in Excel. Flow is also deeply integrated into Teams. Both Power Apps and Flow are deeply integrated into Teams. So you can go take a Power App, show it as a custom tab inside of a team. You can run Flows inside of Teams as well. Flows can be shared with lists and libraries. Uh, and then the Flow team is working on an out-of-the-box request sign-off flow for SharePoint. So there's some pretty canonical cases of, hey, I have an artifact, right? I have a Word document. I have an Excel spreadsheet. I want to send it out for review and approval. We're going to make that a single click flow. You don't have to go define yourself that knows, OK, you know, here's Rob, here's Way. Once they both sign off on it, mark it done, and finalize it in the library, that will just be a single click accessible flow from within your SharePoint lists and libraries. Lots of sessions on Power Up and Flow this week. Um, feel free to take a picture. There's some really great ones for you to go and spend some time learning about different parts of the Power Ups and Flow ecosystem and really how to use CDF, how to use Flow, how to use Power App to enable your enterprise to build some really cool LLB applications. Awesome. So we talked about package apps. We talked about Power Apps and Flow. I'm going to talk quickly about reference solutions, and then we're going to dive into custom development. So as a reminder, reference solutions are this idea that we're taking patterns and the sort of ideas we have about how the Office platform should be used. We're actually writing end-to-end -end solutions. We're working directly with customers and partners who are implementing those and using them, so we're making sure we build something really useful. And then we're actually publishing those end-to-end -end solutions uh, in GitHub as open source solutions that then you can take and deploy directly or uh, use pieces of and embed within your own projects or build on top of. Uh, and we, use, we think of reference solutions as being useful for a couple of things. Uh, one is really targeting specific industries, where if you think about Microsoft 365 and Office 365, it is a pretty broad platform that targets pretty much all industries out there. And there are times when that last mile of functionality to really tailor an experience to healthcare or manufacturing or finance is not something that we're actually going to write, but we would love for our partners and our customers to write that. And we want to help that process by creating these packages that take them along that journey. And the other is kind of these horizontal or departmental solutions. When you think about uh, how to adopt uh, Office 365 and the platform to things like the finance department, how can I have a really tailored solution in order to do financial reporting every quarter? The Microsoft Finance team uses this one in order to go and actually create our quarterly filings with the SEC. Uh, and so we have a series of these different solutions across both industries and horizontals. If you go to dev.office.com and check out our samples there, you can find all of them there. I want to really quickly drill into one uh, called Healthcare Team Huddles, and I'll do a really quick demo for you guys in just a second. Uh, the way that you should think about this, because I'm guessing not all of you have worked in the healthcare setting before, uh, is basically that in healthcare, uh, they essentially have a daily scrum. Think about it that way. Uh, there's a stand-up meeting where once a day at a shift change or every time something really horrible happens in the hospital, you all get together, you have your pens and papers and a whiteboard, and you talk about your ideas for how to deal with the issues, what's going on. You kind of track your progress against the things you've been focusing on for that week. Uh, and hopefully at the end of the week, you remember all the right things. You've written them down well enough on a piece of paper that you can kind of have a summary at the end of the week. Uh, and then you pass those pieces of paper up. Uh, up the chain that you can start to, start to pull together those ideas uh, to start to, to influence processes at the healthcare institution as a whole. Well, what we thought is, hey, Teams as this hub for teamwork is the perfect canvas. We can go and take that and work with uh, customers and partners to build a really tailored workspace for that. We can build it into Office 365 where we've already got best-in-class security and compliance uh, for things like HIPAA. So we have a tool that is, is well-suited and supported by uh, the security and compliance requirements. Uh, and we built this together with several customers and partners who've actually been using it. Uh, and I'll show you really quickly an example of it. The first thing I'll show... I think I got it right. The first thing I'll show uh, is actually GitHub. Uh, so this is actually the solution. You can find all of the code for the solution uh, in github.com office dev. This particular one is Office 365 huddle templates. Uh, so you can go and take all of these different pieces and deploy them yourselves. Uh, you can find a bunch of different templates through there that you can go and browse through if you want to look at some of the others in other industries or horizontals. Uh, the second thing I'm going to show uh, is actually running that solution. Uh, I'll show it really quickly. Uh, it is a very healthcare-specific example. 
But the first thing I'll start with is inside of this, this uh, team, Contoso Health, you can actually see I've got a custom tab here called Metric Input. And the idea is that every day when the healthcare team comes together for their huddle, they've got a set of things that they've been focused on, a set of issues that they're trying to address that week, uh, things like they got some poor care ratings from in urgent care that they wanna go and address, uh, or that the operating room, patient, operating room patient rating is low, and that week they're really focused on that particular metric. They come up with a way to measure whether they're making progress, and each day they come in here during the huddle, and they say, okay, how many did you have? What was our ratings out of this? Pull it in and track that metric over time. Uh, and then throughout their day, when they're actually doing work, running around, uh, going and helping patients, uh, we've actually then created a bot. So within Teams, uh, either on their phone or on a PC, uh, they can actually go tell the bot that they've run into a new issue or they have a new idea. Uh, you can see it actually uses adaptive cards in order to give them a UI to insert those ideas and the metrics they want to track it against. You can actually see uh, it is tracked against the sort of metrics that you are tracking, so you can have a kind of canonical way to, to uh, affect the metrics across your hospital. Uh, and then if I go back into Teams, uh, you can see that those ideas are tracked in an idea board. This idea board is hosted inside a planner, so I'm taking advantage of uh, the kind of tasks that are inside a planner. I have a Kanban board to, to move things from new ideas to in progress to completed and track them along the way. And I even have a way to, to say now, this particular idea is something I think we should share across the hospital. And when you drag that idea into Shareable, uh, there's a webhook that fires a function inside of Azure that will then go and share this with a broad channel across all of the healthcare team huddle leaders across the hospital so that they can look at the stream of ideas that people felt was impactful across it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we've got Power BI connected to all of those metrics so I can actually in real time look at my progress week over week for the metrics that I'm trying to affect. So you can see how we've really taken all the different pieces of this team workspace and we've really tailored it for this team huddle scenario so I can run them not just on a piece of paper and on the whiteboard, uh, but using this tailored tub, hub for teamwork. So just one example of these reference solutions, you can find a bunch more uh, if you go to dev.office.com and check out samples. All right, with that, I will hand off to Tristan to dive into our custom development topics, and we'll go through each one of the technologies that we talked about in the Office 365 platform overview, starting with the graph and canvases, our controls, things like that. Yeah, last thing I'd say on the reference solutions, because I think they're really cool, and you should absolutely go check them out on GitHub, is this is real code that has been tried and tested. This isn't like some guess by us of some sample code you might want to look at. This is how our finance department does something. This is how our legal department does something. This is something we did with customers in the healthcare industry. So both a bunch of great sample code, but some real actual use cases of how the platform should work. So Microsoft Graph. You heard Rob talk about how Graph is the place, the REST API that gives you access to all the data and intelligence that's up in the Microsoft Cloud. But what does that actually mean? Um, we kind of think about three big scenarios when we talk about graph, or three big things that graph does that we're excited about. The first one is rich context, right? The graph can tell you things like, is someone out of the office because that pulls data from Exchange and may have sent an oof message? Great. If I have an approval workflow, I should skip that person because they're not going to be able to approve. I can go find their manager uh, so I can see who their manager is and send that approval to them instead. I can tell you where you might need to be next. Uh, if you saw Cortana this morning giving information about mail and calendar, she was turning around and querying my information from Microsoft Graph to tell me the next meeting that I have, how many emails are in my inbox, all that rich information about me as a person. It can even tell me things like what documents have I been working on recently so that as I'm moving around the ecosystem, I can have intelligent document and people pickers that know things like I work with Rob on Microsoft Graph or these are the last 10 Word documents that I've been editing and the next 10 Word documents I might want to edit as well. A bunch of really interesting and deep insights. So it's not just about taking all the data we have and serving it up to you through sort of a schematized API, although that's super powerful on its own. It knows things like not just the last documents I edited, but what documents have I not touched that might be interesting to me. So it'll know things like, hmm, Tristan, you typically collaborate with these three or four other people in the organization. They're editing these documents. Maybe these are interesting to you. So if you've played with Delve, you'll see Delve is powering the Microsoft Graph to tell me what documents are potentially powerful, potentially interesting for me that I might not even know about yet. It can do things like figure out with between Way and me and Rob, we need to meet and talk about our build demos. What's the best time for the three of us to meet based on our mixed up calendars? And even things like who should a person contact for info on a topic, right? I can query into the Microsoft directory and say, hey, who are the people with subject expertise on 
the open XML file formats. And it'll notify me three or four people with specific domain expertise on that topic based on all the information it has about each of us as members of the system. The last thing it gives me is access to real-time updates. So the graph has the capability for webhooks. You can subscribe to different events and get real-time updates when a new calendar item is added. And I can tell there's a conflict and message the user that, hey, you have two meetings at the same time. What do you want to do about it? When a file's modified, I might want to tell all the people who've touched that file that a change has happened so they can go and look at the updated contract. I might be able to look at my inbox and say, hey, there's a specific mail message that I'm tracking through the system. Every time that message is touched by a different human, I want to go tell people. So you can sort of pick the objects and the pieces of the system you're interested in, attach webhooks, and then respond to the real-time events that happen as calendar items are touched, as emails are sent and received, as documents are edited. So a bunch of really powerful stuff across Microsoft Graph. There are a ton of APIs that we could have showed you in Graph, so I picked a one that I thought was specifically interesting. You'll see a bunch of sessions on Graph when I'm done with this one demo. So if you want to go learn about all the different workloads on Graph, there's tons of opportunity this week to do so. So has everyone played with Graph? Have most folks played with Graph? A few of you. Great. So Microsoft Graph starts with a REST API call to HTTPS Microsoft Graph.Microsoft.com. So the sort of hub of Microsoft Graph and where I'll start is I'm going to call the V1 APIs, so our production API endpoint. I'm just going to ask about me. And when I call that get query, you can already see the results there. It knows, hey, you're Tristan. Here's your title. Here's your phone number. Here's where you sit in the building. All the sort of basic information about me as a human. From here, I could go and query my messages. I could query my calendar. But one of the new APIs we're announcing at Build is the ability to not just access files in OneDrive, but the ability to access file versions. So let's play with that for a second, just to give you a flavor of the kinds of things Graph lets you do. So I'm going to go under my OneDrive. I'm going to go to the root of OneDrive, and I'm going to say, hey, in the extensibility folder, there is a PowerPoint deck that is this talk. And I can say, send on that. And what it'll come back with is all the information about that specific file in my OneDrive. Here's the URL for it if I wanted to go and download it. Here's when it was created, who last modified it. So you can see I created it. Rob was the last one to touch it. But we can go even further. And just to really simple, restful queries, I can say, hey, what versions does that thing have? So we'll go call it query versions. And it'll come back and say, hey, it actually has 42 versions. And you can see the last one to touch it was Rob. Way edited it before that. And we could go back and back through all the changes that the three of us have made to this deck over the last few weeks as we prepared for this talk. But I can actually go in and do a bunch of really interesting things without having to know a bunch about OneDrive with just authoring these simple queries. So I can say, hey, you know, what's version 1.0? Tell me more about that. It'll go and tell me, hey, 1.0 was created by me on May 4th. Great. What's going on with version 10? I can even start to do things like, hey, I actually want that version because I know that Rob, in the middle of the night, made some crazy edits. Uh, so I'd like to know what happened before he went wild with the deck. So I could even go say, hey, I want the contents, right? And what'll happen there? Oh, the content, sorry. Let me go back and fix that typo. We'll query. One of these times I will type it right. And what you'll see is that actually returns a 302 found. It says, hey, I found that version. And then it'll give me a redirect to the place where I could go and grab that specific file. So if I went to that URL right now, it's a special pre-authenticated URL that would let me go and grab the file contents of that version of that file. And all I had to do was issue a couple simple HTTP GET requests to parse through all the file versions that exist, pick one that I want, and get that file. I could even, instead of doing this, say, actually, what I want to do, I want to restore that, because everything he did after that is crazy. So I could call, instead of making a GET request, I could say, graph. I want to post to the restore version endpoint, and I want you to restore version 10 of that file as the current one in the library. And if I went and called that, you'll see it'll return back that the file is locked in this case, because it looks like Wei has it open. If she didn't have it open, what it would do is actually restore that version of the file to be the current one in the SharePoint library, letting me easily recover the specific contents of the file at a specific time, just by editing a couple of simple HTTP calls right here in my application. So that's just one of the many, many things you'll see us talking about with Graph this week. Graph lets you edit every piece of data and every piece of intelligence you might want to know about me. And that list is growing month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year. So lots of cool stuff. 
What's new this week specifically? We sort of look at this in terms of new data in the graph and new capabilities the graph lets you access. You can see file versions in OneDrive. I can access that activity feed in Project Roam, so that cross-device activity feed that exists. I can now access the graph from SharePoint Framework Web Parts. We have a bunch of APIs in beta. Rob talked about Microsoft Teams and the Teams APIs. You can now get at, you know, create channels. You can create teams. You can add people to teams and channels. You can add post messages to teams. You'll soon be able to query messages from those teams as well. And then we also have beta APIs for our bookings application, for some new features in Microsoft Planner, and for the device relay inside of Project Roam as well. So lots of cool stuff. Capabilities wise, we are constantly adding webhooks to different entities in Graph so that you can get those real time updates. Uh, we're adding SDKs for every major programming language. So if you love Java, we have a great Java SDK for Microsoft Graph. If you love JavaScript, we have a great JavaScript SDK for Microsoft Graph, and so on and so on. And then we are going to continue to add a bunch of new capabilities. One thing that's really particularly exciting that I'll call it on this long list is you'll see this tomorrow in Joe's keynote. We are shipping a bunch of pre canned controls for UWP apps that let you access content in the Microsoft Graph. We're going to open source those as well, but they'll be a great people picker. They'll be a great like, document picker, a bunch of controls we think you might need. We're going to pre can those and let you access them inside of your UWP apps just by importing the project that we ship. It's a really cool stuff. Uh, if you're interested, grab them, contribute. That kind of stuff's really powerful. Again, a bunch of sessions on Graph this week. I got to cover one API for five minutes. There will be hours and hours covering all the different APIs on Graph you might care about. I would say, uh, yes. I would say pick a couple sessions if you're going to pick one. Tomorrow at 1.15 p.m., Yina, who is the most knowledgeable person on the planet when it comes to Microsoft Graph, is going to have her session on overall Graph called Microsoft Graph Connect to Essential Data that Every App Needs. Highly encourage you to go attend that session. Yina's an incredible speaker, and that'll give you a great depth overview of Graph and all the capabilities we've added to Graph over the last six months. Cool. All right. Uh all right, so we've talked a bit about the foundation, which is Microsoft Graph that you can use to help build out your solutions, whether they are in the Office Canvas or in your own standalone application. Um, but today we're going to focus a bit more on our canvases and how you can integrate in there. Rob talked a bit about the extensions that we offer and the different types that are available. Um, the, there are three big pieces that we think about when we're coming up with developing and adding to these types of extensions. The first piece is basing them off of web technology. So if any of you in the room have built an add-in, you'll notice that it's based off of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And it is basing these type of integrations off of web technologies that allows us to be able to support them cross-platform. So that's why you can run an add-in, for example, on your Windows, you can run it on Mac, you can run it on mobile. So these two pieces are really based around the development process and making sure that you can write it once, make it available everywhere. But the last piece that we focus on a lot is the modern distribution. So it's not enough just to build that solution, right? You want users to actually get it, to use it, to be able to, to interact with it, to understand it, to get started quickly. So that's another big area that we focus on. So I'm, we're all I'm gonna give you some demos today based around the three canvases, pages, conversations, and documents. And so starting with the document canvas, which is Word, Excel, PowerPoint, or Office apps that you are the content author in. We want to start off by talking about our custom functions in Excel. I think that's number seven. seven. Okay, so what are custom functions? Well, this is the idea that you can create JavaScript functions for yourself, install them through an Excel add-in so that they're available for you to leverage within Excel. This is currently in developer preview for Windows, Mac, and on Excel Online. So this is a way to think of this is that it's similar to the user-defined functions that existed with VBA. And now I've already gone ahead and installed an add-in that supports these functions. So all of these Contoso are functions that I've added myself. I'm going to use this nth prime. 
Just a bit of trivia. Does anyone know what the 10th prime number is off the top of their head? No? No? OK. Oh, let's try again. It's 29. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we'll refresh this. You're our custom function. <laughs> yes. And see what's going on here. Okay. 29. See, it works. Just timed out. <laughs> um, so what I want to do now is show you how we wrote up these functions. Here is my JavaScript where I created my nth prime. You may be looking at that. Don't blame Microsoft. We do know that's not the most efficient way to compute this, but we did that intentionally. And the reason why we did it intentionally is because I'm going to show you these custom functions in Excel on Windows. And what I wanted to show you is the ability to compute multi with multi-threaded um, capabilities on your desktop clients, whether that's Windows or Mac. So I'm going to go ahead and still use N prime, but this time I'm going to reference A1. And I'm going to copy this Paste it here, it's populated. And then I'm going to say I want to change this number to 5. You can see it's pretty real time. It's happening very quickly. And this is the performance that we are hoping to get and have gotten with this uh, custom functions. So I'm going to jump back over here. So another thing that we've been working on are the Excel APIs. We've been adding to them regularly, month over month. We put new APIs in preview. We were recently going to release um, the API requirements at 1.7 here. Um, and what that has is a lot of different things. It focuses on password protection. We added some events around if a table changed, if a worksheet changed, um, and some other charting functionality. So to show you this, I'm going to use Script Lab, which can be installed from the Office Store, and it's a great way to get started leveraging our Excel APIs. So what you'll see is there's an IDE here, and you can, we've created samples for you, and you can scroll through them. They're sorted by what they're relevant to, whether that be ranges or worksheets. And all of our preview APIs, which is where our 1.7 APIs are currently living, can be found under one section. So what I'm going to focus on here is this table change sample. And what it's going to do, I'm going to refresh my run, is it's going to first populate, we're going to populate some data. And then I'm going to go ahead and register for my unchanged event. So what we're going to see is when I click inside the table, if I update this number to 1, you'll notice here in my console, can you see that? I can zoom in a little bit. Maybe not. So <laughs> um, it says that the cell that changed is E7, which is the only cell that changed. Now, if I were to type something in E10, like 12, you'll notice that it's not giving you that event changed. It wasn't part of the table that we were working on. So feel free to install Script Lab, try out the APIs as they're coming through. If you want to just get started building an add-in for Excel, this is a great way to do it. OK. I'm back. Yes. All right. This is a lot of Excel. <laughs> um, but we also added the ability for custom visuals. Custom visuals are a way for you, again, leveraging the modern add-in add platform, to add custom charts into your experience. So if there's a type of chart that you use on a regular basis that you can't actually insert, Today, you can add that functionality. And the way that you can access that is once you've installed the add-in, you can click on this plus button in the ribbon here, and it's more custom visuals. OK, it's telling me I have to select some information. So more custom visuals. And what you're going to see is you're going to see the wizard load up. It's going to have your same tabs that you used to see, your recommended charts, 
all of the charts, but it's also added these custom visuals. So these are what my add-in has installed. And in this case, we're gonna use a sun key chart, which what this is gonna do is it's gonna show you by creating a flow, how many passengers based on the width of the, the stream that's going from one place to another are actually going, let's say from Seattle to New York, which is rather a lot, over 1,200. You also have the ability, if I switch over to this word cloud here, to do some general formatting. So I've created this word cloud. I asked my team before I came, what were their favorite fruits? So they all gave me these examples here. And I think the font's a little bit small, but if I type in a different minimum font, I can change, rearrange. I have the same capabilities that I would with any other charts that exist in Excel. Okay, so we've been we're doing a lot of work in Excel, um, but here's overall on document canvases, some of the things that we wanted to talk to you about today. So we have Excel API 1.5 and 1.6 in general availability. And as I mentioned earlier, 1.7 will be coming out shortly. It's in preview. You can try that out using script lab. Um, and then the custom functions are also available through the developer preview for you to try out as well. The last cool thing I'll mention about the custom visuals, because I think this is one of the cooler things about it, is all those visuals way wrote for Excel, those will work identically inside of Power BI. So you can now go create a custom visual for your enterprise. Let's say you have an airplane engine and you want a visualization for all the parts of that airplane engine in 3D. You can go and create a custom visual for that. You can have it hosted inside of your Power BI dashboards and you can bring that same visual inside of Excel for custom analytics that people want to do if they want to go and play with it in Excel as well. So you have one place, one tool to go and define all the visualizations that matter to you to work across all the apps in our ecosystem. And here are the list of the document canvas sessions that are available throughout the week if you would like more information. Okay, so we talked about the document canvas. The next one is the conversation canvas. So any type of conversation you're having, whether that's one-on-one -on -one through email, whether that's with your team in your team's application, or whether you're just IMing your coworker to ask them a quick question. These are all covered as part of the conversation canvas. So some things that Rob mentioned earlier from the connectors and bots, actionable messages, and again, add-ins that allow you to bring uh, slightly deeper, more intense integration into the conversation canvas. Okay, so one thing we're really excited about and what we've been working really hard on is this concept called adaptive cards. And so adaptive cards came about because we have this idea of, well, fixed templates that we can provide for a developer to have to fit their content into the template that we decide. Or we went the other extreme to HTML canvases, which gave developers a bunch of freedom. But if you wanted to put that so it fit on your iOS, your Android, on the Windows, you have to redo the UI every single time so that it feels like it's a part of that experience. So what you can see here is this idea of adaptive cards, which is somewhere in the middle, providing you with the ability to tell us what you want to show, what types of actions, what types of buttons, but relieving you of the, the need to write that UI over and over again. So this card is showing up for you across all of those different endpoints. So let's see one in action. We have created, let me find it. We have created our own card here, and it's based around a recruiting scenario. But before I talk about that, and I paste that JSON into this, this is our message card playground. And what this allows you to do is play around with, we provide some templates up here that you can click through. It will update and show you different UIs. And you can see what you want your template to look like. You can play around with it here before actually having to build it out. So if I go ahead and paste this in here, this is the card that we created. I can then also choose to send it to myself. So that means now I can see it in all of the places where I would receive my email. Now, for now, Adaptive Cards is available in OWA, but over time, we want to make it available across all of the platforms. So I'm gonna go ahead and send out this email. It tells me my card was sent successfully. I'm gonna go ahead and switch over. I've already received my card. You can see here that this is what the card is going to look like for Outlook Online. 
I have my opportunity to set my calendar interview dates. But I will call out that when you're using the message playground, unless you've already done the work to make these um, actions actionable, they won't work. So I can select this, but it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to actually set the interview date. So that piece isn't done here. So what's really cool is the same thing is possible for you in Teams, right? I can use that same card. And I'm going to do that by asking our bot, the one that's in charge of all our recruiting, to see which candidate. I want to remind myself about Amelia's credentials because her interview is coming up, and I'd like to take a look. So I ask the bot, and it provides me with that same card here. So I can see her experience, whether or not people have offered her a hire or no hire. But this card is very similar to, with some minor adjustments for the UI, what we see in Outlook. If you think back to this notion of a conversation canvas, instead of telling you Outlook and Teams, this is exactly the sort of thing that we're, we're talking about, where you can write one card, you can use it across all the different places inside of Microsoft 365 where conversations happen. And that same markup and technology is actually shared even more broadly than that. Cortana uses adaptive cards, the timeline in Windows uses adaptive cards, the bot framework uses adaptive cards. So this notion of creating these really nice, reusable, but very flexible pieces of your experiences that you can embed within ours uh, works across all these different places with adaptive cards. Right. So there's one more demo I wanted to show you within Outlook today. And this is something that we've been working on across Office apps, is the ability to allow users to have the type of experience and surface the actions that are most relevant to them. So I'm going to go ahead and go into my settings. I'm going to scroll down. Now I'm in an Outlook.com account. This is where this functionality is available today. But over time, you can think of Microsoft as moving towards this idea of thinking through what is the best way to allow users to get those actions that they need in front of them. So you'll start to see this come out across other applications as well. Um, if I select Customize Actions, what you'll notice here, which is a little bit different than before, is, hey, all of the native actions are there. But in addition, I have installed some add-ins. So Evernote, Starbucks, Wonderlist, these are all add-ins that I went and acquired. But maybe I decided that, hey, I'm not really using Evernote anymore, and I'm using Wonderless instead. I can, by making these selections, change what's going to be visible for me when I'm reading a mail. So where Evernote used to be, Wonderless is now there. I could do this interchangeably with native commands, too. Let's say I decided I don't ever want to reply. I don't need it as a short um, command. I only reply all. I could move that into my overflow menu, which is where Evernote has now gone, so that it's not one of my main actions that's available to me. So when we think about the conversation canvas, the adaptive cards are a big part of that. Adaptive cards are available in OA, and they are in preview in Teams. Some other things I want to call out uh, is that we release the Outlook API uh, version 1.6 for Mac, Windows, and web. And if you look over in the coming soon column, one thing that we've been asked for for Outlook is to support add-ins and delegate access scenario, and that is now coming soon. So here's a list of sessions related to the conversation canvas. The two in pink, uh, I've called out the top one is around adaptive cards all up. David will give you a bit more information than I did in his 75-minute session. And then the second one is also an adaptive card scenario, but it's based around payments and Outlook. It, the only other one I'd call out from that list is that if you're in this session right now, you're also missing this build the ultimate hub, ultimate team hub with Microsoft Teams session. So I definitely check that one out online later. Uh, if you're interested in extending Teams, they'll go into detail about all of the extension points there. Great. The last of the canvases we're going to talk about is the page canvas. Um, 
And you know, Wade just talked about adaptive cards, and I, they're just so cool because they're purely declarative, and you don't have to worry about users trusting things, and I can send something, an email that has a bunch of actions, but I don't have to worry about a user saying, I trust this piece of code. Um, the Page Canvas does some really similarly cool things, though, being cross-platform as well. So Page Canvases, you know, you can extend all the core experiences in SharePoint. You can extend pages with SharePoint framework extensions. You can have SharePoint add-ins that are ISV delivered parts on those pages. You can have SharePoint framework web parts that are parts on those pages. We really sat down and thought about, hey, if you learn something inside the Office ecosystem, I want you to get as much mileage out of that knowledge as you can across all the different experiences that leverage what look like page canvases. So one of the things that's a little bit of an early developer preview but something really cool I'm excited to show you guys is the ability to take SharePoint framework web parts and use them not just in SharePoint but also in Teams. So how many people have played with SharePoint framework web parts? A couple. Awesome. If you haven't, I would go look at the dev docs, start playing with the web parts. They're really a great way to extend pieces of a SharePoint page with your own custom content. So what I've done here is I've created a, a launch team for a new product we're building. Uh, and I want to make sure all the regulatory information for that new product launch is properly stored and sorted and ready to go. I wrote a SharePoint web part that I've got stored here. So I've created my own custom page in SharePoint. This web point is in SharePoint. The page is in SharePoint. All the compliance of that data is automatically handled. I'm ready to go from a business knowing where the information is and not having to worry about what third-party service it's stored in, that sort of thing. What you'll see here is that page does exactly what you'd expect. Right here within the SharePoint UI, here's my custom legal matters web part. It lets me both see all the documents, or if I wanted to change the page, I could go and using all the capabilities of the SharePoint framework, I have an option here. I could have just filtered it to current user. I could have that web part on the page instead, so you know I could save and close that version of the page. And now that web part just shows documents for me as Alan DeYoung, the current user of the web part. What I think is incredibly cool, and the thing that we'll talk about, you'll see this in a session later this week that I'll point at, but the thing that's really powerful is, I don't just want that web part or that experience inside of SharePoint. I want it inside of Teams as well, because the launch team is also spending a lot of time having active conversations about this and making sure they've got everything right. Why should they have to switch experiences? right? And why should I have to go learn how to build a separate integration for Teams? I just want to reuse this one in the context of Teams. So we'll jump up here. I've already got it linked. How lucky is that? And what you'll see is inside of that same team, as soon as it loads up, that SharePoint framework web part is hosted as a Teams tab. Uh, and you'll see that same capability. So here's the legal matters piece. That same web part hosted right there in Teams. And I didn't have to change the code. I didn't have to go write a separate Teams integration. All my SharePoint knowledge just played through. And that includes like, you know, I went and added it again. So I'd already added it. You'll see it shows up inside of the add a tab UI like everything else. So I've just packaged up that same web part to work here. That same customization UI works here. So I could say, oh, I want a version that's not filtered to current user. Save. And that'll show up as a new tab right there inside of Teams. It does exactly what SharePoint did. Brings that compliant data, all that compliant capability of SharePoint right into the Teams channel where the people are having conversations and getting work done for this launch. So a really cool example of something you'll see us do. You see it with adaptive cards. You see it again here. You see it with add-ins. We want you to learn something in one place and feel like you've got durable knowledge that lets you go build integrations that work across more and more parts of the ecosystem that makes up Office 365 and Microsoft 365 as a whole. So a couple announcements this week. Um, generally available, SharePoint framework integrates with Microsoft Graph. So from all those SharePoint framework web parts and extensions, I can go call into the graph and use all the powerful data and capabilities we talked about earlier. I can go take full SharePoint pages and host those team tabs. The thing that's in preview is the last part that I showed you, which is SharePoint framework web parts specifically. So taking individual web parts and hosting those as team tabs as well. So a bunch of really cool work about reusable knowledge that you're seeing across the ecosystem. This is the session I'd recommend if you're interested in SharePoint framework or you're interested in sort of that cross page canvas knowledge and how to go build those solutions. Uh, this session tomorrow afternoon is a great place to go learn from VESA all the details of what it would mean to go build and extend SharePoint um, and take that knowledge across the ecosystem as well. Now we'll finish up, talk about how we actually deploy some of this stuff. Yeah, that's one of the big pieces, right? You don't just want to build the solution and then no one can access it. So, 
We have been focusing over the... <laughs> I'm moving away from you. <laughs> over the past... Um, here on something called centralized deployment. So today I'm going to show you centralized deployment within Outlook specifically. And for those of you who may have never installed an add-in within Outlook, there were a couple of different options. Either you could install your add-in through uploading an XML manifest, you could go to the office store and install it for yourself, or we had something called the Exchange Admin Center, which allowed you to install an add-in for the entire organization. But none of these quite gave you the granularity that we were hearing people ask for. So what we're looking at here is the admin portal. Now, if I go under settings, there's an option for services and add-ins. And it will load all of the services and add-ins available. But if I wanted to, I can just filter to an add-in. I'm going to give this some zoom. Now, today I only have Evernote installed, and it's installed for Outlook. So, but if I click on Evernote, I have a couple options that I'm presented with. If I decided I no longer wanted people in my organization to have this add-in, I could completely remove it. I can see the, um, sec the permissions that are required, and I can see who has access, in this case, everyone. So now I'm gonna switch over to John's account here just to show you that, hey, he does have Evernote. It was installed for the entire organization. But John actually asked me recently, he said, hey, you know, I really like to use Trello. It helps me keep track of my tasks. I like the boards, and I can organize everything that's going on. So would you mind deploying this add-in for me? So I can do that by clicking on the deploy add-in option. And I'm, again, presented with that idea of I can upload my own XML manifest or I can go to the store and add those add-ins. So I'm gonna to go to the store because I know Trello is there. I'm gonna go ahead and select Add for Trello. Again, I'm gonna be shown that list um, which tells me the permissions it requires and kind of a brief description of the add-in. Clicking Next presents me with a couple options here. I can make that add-in mandatory. If there was some add-in that everyone in the organization had to use, I would use that mandatory always enabled. It means the user can't disable it, it's going to be there for them. But in the case of John, he just asks me to provide him with the Trello add-in. So I'm gonna go ahead and select the optional enabled action here. So it's gonna appear for him, he's gonna be able to see it, but he can also dis disable it later if he decides he no longer would like to use it. And here's where I have my control over who has access. I can give it to everyone. I can give it only to myself. I can give it to John. I can give it to Tristan, Rob. If there was a design team that had their own group, that all of them wanted that add-in, I could put that group here as well. So I have complete control over who in the organization is going to be able to see this add-in. So I'm going to go ahead and type in John. Save this setting. And now it's going to take a little bit. It's going to install that add-in for John. So we have our confirmation. You can see now it's appeared in this list here. So now if I switch back over to John's email and refresh, we should see is that Trello is going to appear, should appear, he says it could take up to three minutes. All day it's only taken like 30 seconds. Please sit quietly for two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go back, and you can see here who has access. You can see that it's only John. So now we're going to try one more time and see if it updates. There we go. Just Ooh. took a little bit extra time. All right. So I'm going to switch back over to talk about the second piece. So we can have the users with the add-ins now. The admin can control that if they would like to. But there's a second piece, and potentially a very interesting piece for developers. We have analytics. Now, we've had analytics for, in the developer center, but it was only based around acquisition. And so you may have wondered, well, here's my acquisitions, but how do I know how many users are actually using my add-in? Are people coming back? Are they only using it once? Or maybe you thought, well, now I have to set up another way for me to get these analytics so that I can know what's going on with my add-in. Well, we've added a usage tab here. So this week, 
Now, any office add-in developer who has an add-in listed in the store can now see this usage data. Now, this is the page for the usage data, and the first thing that you'll see at the top is that we're going to tell you how many devices are using it. But we also provide an extra filter there for you, which is that black line that tells you who are the new users. At the top, you can see you can choose the frame of time that you want to look at, whether that's 30 days or three months. And in the right-hand corner, we provide you a filter that allows you to say, hey, I only want to look at the Mac usage, or maybe I only want to look at the Windows usage. Or maybe your add-in works on Word and Excel, and you only want to know what's going on with PowerPoint. The next piece that you'll see is retention information. So a user came, they used my add-in on week one, but by week five, are they still using that add-in? Or maybe, hey, I just added this new feature that I thought would impact the retention. I think users would really like it. It would make it much more interactive, and so users will continue using my add-in week over week. You can see here whether or not that worked. And at the very bottom, we provide information based on the geography of users. So if you're wondering, hey, should I localize into a different language, you can see who's installing your add-in in which country. Or you can determine which markets maybe aren't using it and consider adding that support for that language. So when it comes to acquisition and deployment, a couple other things that I'd like to call out. Uh, centralized deployment is also available for Teams. And we've made in-app discovery of store for Teams much more visible within the application. So thank you all for joining us today. If you would like to learn more, you can visit dev.office.com, join our office developer program, you could even join a hackathon with us. And we do offer regular community calls. So if you have any questions or you want to just hear what's going on, whether that's with Outlook, SharePoint, or Graph, you can join those community calls, ask questions, and just learn about what features we're working on. We even will ask you questions there as well. Like if there's one thing, if you're not a member of our developer program, I would say go home, load up dev.office.com, and join today. Not only do you get access to the team, the engineering team spends a lot of time listening to you, having two-way dialogues about the things we're building, announcing new features before they're public. You also get an Office 365 tenant with 25 users, I believe, that you can go and use to start building your solutions, testing them out. It's a really great sandbox dog food environment for you to spend time doing your development that's separate from your company's production tenant that lets you Get building quickly. That's a customized tenant specifically for development that you'll see improve over time to be more and more dev specific and dev friendly. So it's absolutely worth it. It's free. So there's no like, go home and I'm going to secretly ask for your credit card. Uh, join. Please let us know what we can do to make the dev program better for you. That's something the team spends a lot of time making sure is useful for you as a community. Absolutely. Last thing we'll mention, please do send evals in. Sounds like there's some pretty cool prizes. I wish I could evaluate myself and win a drone, but I guess I can't. Uh, but you guys should absolutely evaluate us and win a drone because that sounds really cool. Uh, and come see us at the booth. The last thing you don't see on here is uh, I think Wei and I, after this, we'll hang out here for a bit. We'll walk back over to the conference center to the office booth on the show floor. There's a bunch of members of the team there. A couple of them are hiding in the back here right now. Uh, we'll be over there answering questions. Happy to talk about all funny things Office 365, Microsoft 365 for sure. I think we have, wow, we have seven minutes. All right, so we'll take a couple questions uh, and then we'll hang around for a bit afterwards too. So, uh, so first of all, uh, you guys covered a lot in the last hour. Very high, high nutritional content for the session, so thank you. Um, on the first demo that you showed, Rob, with the SurveyMonkey add-in, uh, that search box was pretty interesting and it sounds like there's a lot of, a lot of intelligence behind that search box. Who am I working with, working on surveys? Could you say a bit more about what the Graph API exposed there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll, I'll say two things. One is definitely, uh, especially if you're building a UWP or Windows application of any sort, go check out uh, the Windows Community Project and you will find our new UWP controls for the Graph, which includes things like People Picker. So you can get some amount of that functionality kind of off the shelf. Um, so I'll start there. Uh, the second I'll say is that the API that they're calling in the graph is an API called the People API. 
Uh, so if you go on the graph and you say me slash people, uh, you can get back what is uh, kind of the default result set, which is whoever I've been working with most often. So for me, it would say people like Tristan, even though our common manager is only Sacha, it would know, hey, these guys are in a lot of meetings together, they send a lot of email, uh, so they're probably working with one another. I'll get kind of an ordered list back. That also supports um, a search query string on it. So in the query string parameter, you can say search. Uh, and search supports a couple of different pretty awesome things. One is um, a topic. So I can say in that search string, I can say topic colon, and I can type in something like survey, which is what they were doing in their case to show the people that I might have been communicating with about surveys. Uh, and I can also add on a string uh, to search for people's names. Uh, so I can do things like type in Tristan, uh, and that supports a bunch of cool things like phonetic matches, so I don't have to spell Tristan correctly. I can do partial matches there. Uh, and it also supports things like uh, what we call social relevance. So it would know I communicate a lot with that Tristan, and even though Satya is our only common manager, I probably mean him as opposed to some of the other Tristans at Microsoft. And that's all kind of built into that search query string. V very cool. And is that limited to people within my company? Um, it's limited, the, the people API works for both people within your company, so in your directory, and also works for contacts. So uh, it'll use things like signals from the emails that you've sent in order to be able to, to, to surface people outside of your company as well as their long, excuse me, as long as you've had some email communication with them. Great, thanks. You can see a great example of it here. So all I did was call graph.microsoft.com slash me slash people. I searched for Rob's. It knew the most relevant Rob for me is Rob Howard. And then if I were to scroll down, all the other Robs that I have contact with at work, share meetings, share email, share document edits, those are listed in sort of a decaying order of likely relevance. Yeah, go ahead. If I go to dev.office.com, I find many examples uh, with Angular, React, and Vue.js. So the question is, in which direction are you going to? Will you support more Vue.js? And when will we see Office UI Fabric for Vue.js? So, so yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we didn't talk at all about Office UI Fabric, so I'll take just a second to, to plug that, which is this is a, another open source framework for us. You can see a trend here. We're open sourcing an awful lot these days. Um, and Office UI Fabric is the same CSS, JavaScript, uh, sort of styling controls that we use to build our own products. So things like uh, OneDrive and Outlook Web Access are based on this. Um, and we make that framework open source so that you can build experiences that feel like a native part of Office as well. Uh, and we have a, a, a few different flavors of Office UI Fabric. And there are kind of a couple of different answers to the question. One is that we have this kind of vanilla Office UI fabric that's not specific to any kind of JavaScript framework. And that's the one uh, that can be used most broadly across different frameworks. I'd say that more and more, we internally in our teams are investing in React as a framework we're building our own UIs with. So the one that's most complete you'll see is React. Uh, there is also a huge amount of interest from the community, in particular in Angular. And so the community contributes uh, to, to the Office UI Fabric Angular version. Uh, and we actually would love to have more versions of that project for other JavaScript frameworks uh, if folks are interested in helping us uh, support that through community-driven contributions. Oh, I see. So, so the direction is not clear which uh, framework will you support more in the future, React, Angular, or Vue.js? Well, I'd say internally we do quite a bit of development work in React, yeah. and so a lot of the work that we do, we just automatically yeah. will open source and kind of give back in that way. Okay. Uh, and then it really depends on the community and their contributions for what other frameworks we would support. And Angular has been the most popular one other than React right now in terms of community contributions. Okay, thank you. Great, other questions? Sure. Oh. Does one of you want to run to the mic? Uh, yeah, so there, there's two good tools that I use to show how you could query graph. Um, one of them, if you go to developer.microsoft.com slash graph, what you'll see right here is one of the things up in the top is Graph Explorer. That's a really simple web tool that'll let you query all the different pieces of graph from a simple web interface. So you can see I can log in either as myself or we have some demo data. And then you can just go splunking. Like it'll even do some autocomplete and show you so I can 
hit the slash after me, it shows me all the different things that are there. I can go look in the docs and poke through that, but I can make queries for any of this stuff. I can say, hey, who's my manager, and run that query. I won't show his name. Uh, I probably shouldn't show his phone number, but you, you get the idea that I have a manager, and without having to go build an app, I can go query all the different pieces of the graph, see how they work, try out different things. It's a really easy way to get started. The other tool that I used on my Mac here is called Postman. It's another great tool for issuing web queries and responses. It lets me set everything up so that I can just go playing and learning how different queries work, the data that gets returned, that kind of fun stuff. The other really cool thing I'll point out about the Graph Explorer is that if you click on Show More Samples in the bottom left, you can actually see we've got a bunch of samples for all of the growing bits of functionality that are part of the Microsoft Graph. And if you turn one on, we'll actually include the samples in this bottom left-hand uh, pane. And oops. Uh, and when you click one of those, we'll actually automatically load it up into uh, the Explorer so you can try it out yourself. So you can see a bunch of different samples there automatically. So you can see that by clicking the recent, it shows me the query for that is me drive recent. And then it'll show you all the different files that are recent files that I've edited. Back to my context point earlier. Both great tools. Graph Explorer is especially awesome because you don't have to do anything. You just browse to our developer portal, click Graph Explorer, and you're off to the races trying out the graph, the different queries you can run on graph, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you just browse to dev.office.com, on the front page there, there is almost always a call to action that says join the developer program. Uh, and if you join the developer program, just sign up with uh, an existing Microsoft account or org ID, and we'll uh, give you a UI to go provision a new tenant. So you can go and, and uh, use that as your development environment. So you join now, and I'm off to the races. What, what, what will you do to push the Office App Store more so we can make money with yeah, so one of the things that you've seen, so the question was, what are we doing to, to drive traffic to the Office App Store? One of the things that you've seen recently is that uh, we've integrated third-party applications that connect to Office into App Source. So if you go to appsource.microsoft.com, uh, you'll see that there's a huge amount of Office applications that are available there, and that's uh, driven a significant amount more traffic. If you're an ISV building applications, uh, when people acquire from, app, from AppSource, they also, you also get a lead written into your CRM system so that you can follow up with them uh, if you'd like to go and uh, sell to their organization. The, the second thing that I'd say is that probably the most important acquisition channel we have is our in-app galleries. So when you're inside Word, Excel, PowerPoint, when you're inside SharePoint, and we're investing really heavily in those. In fact, uh, you might actually see experiments ongoing right now where you'd see different treatments inside of the core office apps that raise the prominence of these third-party applications inside of our experiences, because we think that's a great way to connect people with meaningful functionality. Um, so as long as you've got an experience that people can at least try from within those, those uh, applications and, and kind of get a taste for what it is, and you can build a connection with them that way, uh, I would absolutely expect that channel to grow very quickly over the next several months. Any other questions? I think we're out of time. Oh, one more. Yeah, I individuals can even go sign up for the developer program separately. So you can sign in, you can get your own developer tenant that's kind of your own siloed space to do development. And then of course, if you want to deploy it all the user in your organization, you're going to do that through the administrator in your organization. But when you're doing development, you can do that kind of on your own through the developer program. So, so you can see Tristan's actually signed in with his at Microsoft.com account. And you know, despite what I believe that Tristan is a very trustworthy person, he is not an admin on the Microsoft.com tenant. Um, but he can then go click this set up a subscription button and get his own separate subscription to do development on that separate from Microsoft.com where he can be an admin and do all that sort of stuff. And then once he's built his code and he's ready to deploy it, he can go work with the, the MSIT folks to do so. The, um, what we've found often is having both a central one where your team can bring stuff together, but also an individual one where you can really work on your own and iterate without having to be an administrator is a good combination. Um, and that's part of why we've got them readily available through the developer program is it gives you more flexibility without having to be an administra administrator in your environment where you're de deploying uh, to go and iterate very quickly uh, without having those extra hurdles. Does that make sense? Awesome. Okay.
All right, thanks very much. If you guys Thank have you any other much. questions, please do come by the booth. There, there are folks there w willing and able to answer your questions uh, at any hour of the day. Thank you.